Right, so let's get straight to it. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Razwana Bukum. Um, she's uh, from, well, she lives in Singapore now. Um, she's a lecturer at Singapore University of Social Sciences and a climbing junkie. Um, the next person I'd like to bring on board is Dr. Sakya Haq. She's a medical practitioner and still finds the time to set up an initiative uh, to encourage more women in Bangladesh to travel. And the last person is Saiza Cruz Bakani. I hope I pronounced your name right. Uh, Saiza is a Filipino and street and documentary photographer based in Hong Kong and is also award winning and is also the Fujifilm ambassador. So I'm super excited to be uh, moderating you guys. Um, so we don't have much time because time seems to fly very fast when you're hearing exciting stories. So the first thing, um, I always prefer that people introduce themselves. So maybe you could just say a little bit about your background very fast, about you know, what you do and what got you into traveling in your own perspectives. Why, why, how did your passion come about? Then we'll talk about the barriers. So maybe uh, we can start with uh, Razwana. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm really glad to be here. Um, maybe a little bit about my background. I was just sharing with Anita earlier. I did law and then I moved from Malaysia to Singapore. I was stateless for a long period of time. Um, that kind of prevented me from traveling. But when I moved to Singapore, I started working in a children's home. And eventually I started working with the ministry. I was working with uh, offenders. So my major is in criminology. And I've never really felt this fear of traveling. I think that's one of the things. And why I like to travel and climb mountains is mainly because of the very stressful job that I was doing um, for close to 19 years, I was working with offenders. So that really, you know, traveling and climbing really helped me kind of like find myself. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Sakia Hawk. Uh, being a doctor is my profession, but being a traveler is my passion. So, yes, uh, I love traveling and um, I'm the founder of Travelers of Bangladesh, which currently has you know, 25,000 members. I have already talked about it. So yes, I would, um, I would love to see the world someday like so many inspiring women is doing. And obviously, I'm saving up for that. And I have traveled to a few countries. Oh, so that's it. I'm like handing it over to Chaisa. Hi, I'm Saiza. So I'm a photographer. Uh, travel for me, I travel for work, but because I love my job, it's not like working. So I'm always curious about the world. Okay, great. So we know a little bit about them. So let me get to some questions. So um, Razwana, can you just tell us uh, why you love climbing and how do you get prepared before a climb? Okay. Um, I, I don't know whether you managed to read anything about me. I come from a very conservative family background. Um, I never really traveled on the public bus before when I was studying in JB. Uh, my dad didn't allow me to do any kind of sports, so that really prevented me from doing a lot of things. And then um, subsequently when I um, got married and you know, then I got a divorce and uh, you know, when I was raising my boys, I realized I can do many things, you know, including doing marathons and all that. So from a marathon, I went on to climbing mountains. I started with one of the toughest mountains in Malaysia, Gunung Tahan. And it was not easy. I, I mean, every mountain has got its own challenges, and you actually literally feel like you're going to die in all these mountains. Uh, <laughs> because, especially Gunung Tahan, because Gunung Tahan is not easy at all. Please don't do that if you really want to climb a mountain. Go and climb a smaller one. Um, but eventually, you actually feel a sense of accomplishment, and being with the nature really helps, especially if you're in a high, stressful type of job. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you have kids, right? So do, have you ever brought them climbing with you? Or how do they feel like, when you say, like, okay, mom's going to go on a, another climbing trip? Okay, so I'm kind of like a, I'm not really a great mom, I think. <laughs> uh, okay, so, you know, I was just sharing with some of, some of my, you know, friends here that I've met, and all of them are really amazing. One of the job hazards I have as a, as a probation officer, day in, day out, I'm reading charges, you know, and I'm reading statement of facts. Uh, and I'm looking at young kids getting into trouble with the law. So when the kids were very young, I literally used to make them repeat the probation conditions and kind of memorize the penal code. So that was not good. 
that was not good at all. And I prevented them from hanging around in certain areas, you know, playing soccer because, you know, you can get into trouble if you're playing soccer. But I did bring them climbing. And my youngest son was actually 11 at that time. I didn't bring him to Tahan, but I brought him to Kinabalu. Very bad altitude sickness. He thought he's going to die. Um, the guide told me, you know, look, I got to weigh your son. My son is severely underweight. So he said, I still have to weigh him because if anything happens, I need to bring him down and I will charge according to his body weight. Okay? Yeah. So um, that was really a very tough decision. But I felt that working with cases who get into trouble with the law, um, I felt that what was really missing is really that grit that you need to instill in children. So I was not very concerned about their academic abilities. My concern was really whether they were getting into trouble. Yeah, so that's why I brought them out. And, and I still do this. Uh, they go diving and they go climbing. But my younger one refuses to do that. I think he had a traumatic experience. Uh, he's, he's 17 now, but he refused to climb again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we're just going to jump ahead to uh, Sakya. Now, I'm really fascinated that you started this travel initiative for, for in Bangladesh. And from my limited uh, understanding of Bangladesh, I wish I've been there before, but I haven't yet. Yeah. Um, I'm, if I'm not wrong, things are quite conservative. Yes. So therefore, I'm assuming, if I'm not wrong as well, that uh, travel, there are limitations, right? But there must be some kind of habits that, that Bangladeshi women, what is it that they like to do when they travel? So give us a picture of what Bangladeshi women are when, they, when they're traveling. Because I have a feeling that there's going to be something similar. Like but, where yeah. they like to travel? Where they like to go, what do they like to do within that certain sort of um, cultural confinement? Uh, so How do they find if that I talk about the general women, they don't actually like go out that much. Yes, first one. And if I talk about the traveler women, which are like increasing in a rapid, like, Yes, slow more right now. So they love to travel to, because you know Bangladesh has the longest sea beach in the world. So it is around 160 kilometer. So yes, that is the most touristy spot in Bangladesh. And there is the largest mangrove forest, the Shundarbans. So uh, other than these two spots, there are many beautiful spots in Bangladesh, which might be hard for other tourists or other foreigners to go by. But for Bangladeshi women, it is very accessible. Like there are, um, lakes full of water lilies, there are green uh, guava market, floating market in the rivers, and there are many places where you can trek and see different kinds of waterfalls. So you can just like uh, climb up the hills and uh, see very, uh, very, uh, a lot of waterfalls. So there are a lot of options that now women are opting for, and uh, luckily or fortunately that the number of trekking girls are increasing at a certain rate. I mean, it is, uh, we didn't know that we could climb hills or we could climb mountains, but yes, uh, recently um, in 2012, Bangladesh has climbed, I mean, the first Bangladeshi women has climbed the Everest as well. So that was the first, but after that, many women are more into trekking, I think, in different hills and different waterfalls. That's great. And, um but do, what was, how did they overcome those cultural barriers to do that? I mean, typically, so do they do it by going in a group of women? Do they ask permission before they go and travel? What, what are Bangladeshi Deshi women doing in order to be feel more liberated to, to Yeah, travel? generally, the cultural barrier is a lot. I mean, different, it is very different from Malaysia in Bangladesh. I mean, you can't go there wearing shorts first thing. And uh, there are many other things that, uh, that puts the barrier. But the thing is, the Bangladeshi women, um, they ha have to take permission from their family first. And that's where we can help them. And also, um, after getting permission, they actually don't travel solo. Yes, they don't travel solo, generally. Yes, because there are no, as I said, I think that there are no decent hotels or safe hotels. I remember there is a very beautiful part in Bangladesh called uh, Silet, where are very, uh, there are so many green hills and you can see crystal clear water. And um, there are uh, like uh, one, uh, one kind of swamp forest. I don't know if you know what is swamp forest. So the thing is, um, the Bangladeshi women generally form a group of girls, or maybe with men as well, if their family permits, uh, with husband or with any male partner, but they do travel. I mean, they are traveling now. So I think they are breaking the cultural barrier, mm -hmm. and 
still they have to maintain their security, they have to maintain the family issues, they have to maintain their dress codes, because some things in Bangladesh is a no-no. So uh, as uh, in the earlier panel, they say that you should know your boundaries and you should know or research about the place you go. So the security or safety is in your hands. So if you like travel uh, safely and securely, I think Bangladesh would be and can be a safe place and there can be no barriers. And I like that point that you brought up that, they, that you do help them get permission from the family. Because while I, I understand being a rebellion because I am one, at the same time, I have to say even I do also respect my... So I have gone to all these conflict countries, but I wouldn't have gone without the blessing of my parents as well. So there is also striking that balance and also knowing your boundaries. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up that that shouldn't necessarily be a barrier, but it can actually also facilitate that, right? Um, so, okay, we'll go to Saiza now. Um, now, Saiza, um, I'm not going to go a little bit too much about your, your background. The fact that a little bit that you, know, um, you went to Hong Kong as a domestic worker and then your employer uh, loaned you some money to buy your first camera. Um, but, and from that, and you've become a world-renowned photographer that we'll talk a little bit more. But I really want to talk about the fact that you have a great passion about the intersection of labour, migration and human rights. Mm -hmm. So coming from somebody like you, and of course in the perspective that we are talking about travel, and migration is about travelling, why is it that you feel very passionate about it, and what is it that you, you do in that area of work in order to, what is it that you're sharing about that work, or that you're trying to do in that area of work? Well, for me, uh, it's really important for me to focus on the intersections of labour, travel, or migration, and human rights, because I'm a migrant worker, so... I'm in a very privileged position to tell the stories or share the stories of other women who went through what I went through because that is my experience. So for me, I mean, I want to tell a lot of stories. I do tell a lot of different stories, which is very much away from the usual human rights, uh, migration stories. But uh, I need to tell this story because I feel like at this age, I'm very lucky that I found my purpose. Kind of thing. And I think that's, that's something that we never think about is that, so I often think about, so when my, my mom is being very impatient with a domestic helper, and I said, do you know that she traveled all this way by herself to earn a better life for her family? And that's a different kind of you know, travel that maybe you can think about. I mean, you want to talk about barriers? <laughs> I think that's, that's one of the biggest barriers. I don't think we recognize enough and that they're still able to find an earning and, and also having to learn also of all sorts of things in from a less privileged position, right? Well, migration is inevitable. It's, it's going to happen. Mobility is going to happen. And it's going to be there. So I'm not saying that migration is bad. It's not bad. For me, I don't believe it's bad because it's going to happen. We cannot stop it. The world is so connected right now that we all have the rights to travel even though it's for work, even though it's for economic mobility or econo upward mobility. But as a woman or as someone who were given the platform to talk about migration, I'm always advocating that what we can do for travelers or for mi migrants is to create an inclusive society where everyone, where everyone have the equal opportunity to be treated as human beings. That's it. I'm not saying that, oh, you should stop traveling or you should stop migration because it's bad, because it's not true. I enjoy, I mean, I remember when I was young, I really want to leave my village. <laughs> it's not like someone forced me to like, hey, go to Hong Kong and work. No, I want to leave my village. I think that's one part that we don't look at migration. Other women, especially, or other people just want to leave and find themselves. And I found mine. So I think putting them in this stereotype that they're leaving because they're poor and they're coming over to, t to take over jobs is really not good because maybe they just want to find themselves. Yeah. You know, they're human beings too, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I know you tell your stories through uh, photographs, so, um, and I, I looked through your website, I know you've done tons of photographs, but maybe you can share with us um, two of your favourites and sort of reflecting what you're just talking about and, and the kind of stories that you're trying to share with people. Maybe just two examples, is that possible? Well, I have a series called Love and Poetry and Isolation of the Soul. 
So it's street photography. It's more in the art world rather than the usual uh, journalism stuff that I do. Isolation of the soul, I started doing it in 2009 because I felt so lonely in Hong Kong. So when I was in Hong Kong, I felt so lonely because I was alone most of the time. And photography became, a, became my tool of expression because I'm not good with words. I, I mean, I did not finish in university, so my English is no good luck. But I speak Cantonese, so. <laughs> so for me, um, photography became an expression because I cannot yell to the world way back that, hey, I'm lonely, hey, I'm sad. So I started taking photos of these individuals who are surrounded by these massive buildings that no matter how they're in a society where it's very much you know, moving and active, they still feel lonely. Yeah. But then when, after that project, I realized, I was always curious about things that I don't understand. For example, I don't understand religion. I don't understand romance. I don't understand hatred. So those things, I always try to express my questions through photograph. I always see people expressing their love on the street, like public display of affection, kissing, hugging, holding their hands. And my, us my reaction way back was, hey, get a room. You know what I mean? Because, well, I don't have someone to do that with. So as I'm observing them, I, I, re I started making this as a project. I started collecting all these photos of these people because I thought it's, a, it's an echo or it's a contrast from my isolation of the soul. But then I realized that these two people decided to actually be alone, but this time they're with someone else. So it's still very much connected. It, it sounds so poetic and artistic. And honestly, it's like, it's just cheesy. But I love that project because with the world right now, especially with the world, with the noisiness of the world, we need to celebrate love. We need to look at love because love is happening right now. I love you all. You know what I mean? Like we're here together. So this is love. So we need to celebrate it. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm blabbing again. <laughs> no, it's all right. No, that's great because somebody asked me recently, like, what is it like to travel as a colored person in a very white place? And so I gave like 10 things. But the last one was that I, I listen to a lot of songs about love. And I think that resonates as well. So, you know, it's because you put it positive. So if you can't tell yourself, then listen to nice music. But anyway, going back to, to Rezwana. So... How do you, so you were talking about like, <laughs> so it's quite funny, you were saying that every mountain that you climb, you feel like you're dying or you're going to die. <laughs> so that sounds like the very reason you should not do it. <laughs> so, so how do you both, especially uh, mentally prepare to do this? Because, you know, I mean, research is one thing, but do you have like the kind of mental uh, processes that you go to, to? What do you do? Um, I would say that it's, it's really important to have that resilience because it's mind over body type of thing, you see. Your body can give way and I know, you know, somebody's laughing at me here. But then, yeah, the thing is that um, it's really about whether you want to accomplish that particular task, whether you want to actually complete. A lot of people have told me that, uh, why don't you just walk? Why do you need to climb, right? Um, so, you see, the thing is, I've been climbing for the last 10 years, and other than Gunung Tahan, the second mountain I went to was Everest Base Camp. And at that, at that point, I didn't know that I have very severe altitude problems. Um, I only found that out last year when I went to Kilimanjaro with my sister, and I was turning blue because I was with my sister. Most of the time, I'm trekking. It's very hard to find friends who want to trek with you because they would rather go to a spa holiday and, you know, not... Because they say this is not a holiday. It's not a cheap spot, you need to buy expensive equipment, you need time away from work, you don't go and climb for two days, you need at least a week or more, um, so you go with strangers, right, but when I went with my sister last year, it was just the two of us and, you know, it's another interesting thing about that, because I went with a local tour guide in Tanzania and there was 17 other male guides and porters with us, we were together for nine days, eight nights and guess what 
none of the fear thing came to my mind. But anyway, beside the point, right? She, she was telling me I was turning blue and all that. And then subsequently, I realized uh, it was really bad. Um, I have a picture that, she, that looks like I'm dead at the, at the summit. Um, and I brought it back and I showed it to the doctor. And that's when he told me I really need to take my medication. So uh, again, I went to, without taking medicine because I don't really like to take medicine. And I went to Kinabalu, that was my third trip up to Kinabalu, but this time uh, at a very low altitude, 2000 plus, I was already turning blue. I was very lucky that group that I was in, there was a doctor and she knew what was happening and she gave me the medication. Uh, so my last trip, when I went to uh, Machu Picchu, I was in uh, Peru for three weeks. I took the medicine all the way. Uh, I went to the Rainbow Mountain and that was pretty high as well. So it's a lot of it got to do with mind over body. And another thing about this whole uh, need to kind of torture yourself, right, probably comes from the fact that you need to kind of like build... Okay, so like I was sharing, my, my family is very conservative. My mom uh, don't see why I need to climb at all. I mean, yeah. she, she stays home and she watch all the soap operas. She's not the active sort at all, you see. Uh, and on top of that, there was the other thing as well. I had the inability of not traveling because I was stateless. And, and without a passport, I couldn't go to a lot of places, you see. So all these things come together. And then when I had my citizenship, um, uh, and I have a Singapore citizenship, though I was born in Johor, and you, I, I think most of you know how strong Singapore passport is. So that makes it easy as well, mm. you know, to go. So now I don't really want to go on a holiday where I'm just sitting and doing nothing. I do want to go on a holiday that allow, allows me to do some sort of activity. So it sounds ADHD. like you found your passport to freedom and you just took opportunity to do that, right? Because that's what it was. That moment that you were allowed to leave the country... You just grabbed it. So whatever, I, I'm, I'm guessing that. I'm interpreting it as then the fear is secondary already. Yes. Because it's about just, you've yes. been given this opportunity after being limited. So that's great. That's wonderful. So, okay, what kind of cultural barriers did you have to overcome, overcome personally, uh, as, as Akia? I mean, you must, you're, you're, you yourself, your personal journey, because you obviously come you know, with family and your friends and relatives saying all sorts of things. Um, personally, um if you say barriers, then I can define it more easier way. So, like, um, Bangladesh is a small country. Yes, the parents are protective and conservative, and they don't uh, let women travel alone. It is true. But again, we are liberal at um, being, I mean, if you are Muslim, you don't have to necessarily wear hijab. So it's liberal in that way. So um, in, uh, in different parts of the country that I face that uh, they don't like, um, they don't support it if I don't, if I don't wear hijab. They like, it, they like to put it in a mandatory way. So I face problems uh, about this. And again, um, as we traveled a lot, we face problems like um, in the roads, um, say, if I am riding uh, at, uh, at some road to, uh, towards some destinations, there might be some trucks that are, that, like, knew that we are girls, and they would just push us like this. And so um, there are many other barriers, like um, when I came to Malaysia uh, for the first time, I knew that uh, I have stepped into something, some place different. For the first time, I saw people of different culture, and I knew, and the food was different, and the persons were uh, different, and uh, yes, so there are so many cultural barriers we had to face. So uh, in, uh, in back there, when we travel in a group with girls, so the girls can be free. I mean, they don't have to wear uh, like hijabs, or they don't have to be very covered up because it's only with the girls. So that's how we managed to break the barriers because we are with the girls. And the most interesting thing is, uh, whenever we travel, the girls like put on too many makeups on their face because yeah, it's with girls. No one is like wondering if you have to go to the washroom and put on makeup and come back look pretty, but just they do it all open. And also, uh, there are so many experiences. Um, we, we did travel at night, and um, so basically we didn't ever face any problem because they don't have any idea that girls can travel at night. So, yes, they never thought that two girls will be traveling there. They thought they would be men. 
And I know that I faced problems with uh, like keeping the dupatta together. Yes, I think if my mom like saw me now, they, she would have said, "Where is the dupatta? You know what is dupatta? Like a scarf or something?" So yes, I think it is changing now. The uh, city girls are very modern right now, uh, but it would change in the villages as well. I think hopefully. Great, and um, Saiza, um, what are the so you? became a photographer from becoming a domestic worker, right? So you must have had a lot of barriers and comments from all different perspectives. Perhaps you can share a little bit with us um, that experience and what you did to overcome that. If we're going to talk about barriers, we're not going to be done by <laughs> in 18 minutes. Top two. We're going to be done tomorrow. <laughs> so, well, it was like when I was born, Barriers is my middle name, so many. But one thing that I find really hard is the passport, the visa problems. It's always the hardest for me because I need to be mobile. Like for example, someone will message me, oh, can you go to this country because you need to photograph this. And then if I check it, it's like I need to apply for a visa and it will take me three weeks to get that visa and I cannot give my passport because I need to be able to have my passport all the time with me. So what, that's one of the barriers that, you know, the, those things. But then for me personally, I think if I sum it up, it's patriarchy, <laughs> you know, as a woman, it's so much harder, like I'm listening to your stories, men doesn't need to go through that, but why do we need to go through that, you know what I mean, like why do we need to explain ourselves that we're climbing a mountain, when men, I'm sorry, I'm starting to sound like an activist again. Okay, let's go back to being friendly. <laughs> anyway, for me, I think the greatest barrier is uh, patriarchy. And personally, for me, the hardest one is the passport problem. But I love oh. my country. I was given a lot of opportunities to change it. But I'm so stubborn that I'm going to make it happen. You know? I do have the same problems, you know. I mean, it took me like four weeks to have Malaysian visa. Right. So, and yes. you didn't stop And her. they like <laughs> phoned me and checked. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. Yeah. yeah, but the thing is, they checked my profile. They checked the uh, letter that Zafigo X gave me. And if I have bank solvency, which is very tough, and the bank certificate, and this, they, they just like phoned me a lot to have different types of documents to at last give me the visa. And I'm glad you highlighted that because I think I wanted to show that that the kind of barriers that you go through is not it's just beyond culture. It's patriarchy, it's uh, a bureaucracy. But you're still here today, and that's great. And I hope that serves to be a great in, inspiration. Now, quickly before we go on a, a Q and A, because what that lady said about what she faced in Nepal and um, in where was it Nepal and the other place. Um, about what happened to you. So we talked about prevention a lot and about researching beforehand and about having that confidence. And of course, you can build a resilience because I believe that the more you travel, then the more you become confident. But, but let's, talk, let's be real as well. Things do happen. Um, so what do you do after things happen? So I think that that's something that you were talking about, two points about predators, that's one. But also the fact that you went blue, you almost died, but you still overcame it because there were ways to overcome it as well. So I think that's important. But you had a very interesting perspective on, on predators as well, um, through your work. I, okay, so it's like, you know, whenever you go through an incident, it's important for us to kind of like share that incident, to go through that traumatic experience. It, you kind of like need a closure. I mean, that's what, that's what uh, we, we do with our cases, you know, like in social work and counselling and all that. Um, so that's really important, but at the same time, you need to have a plan. You know, like you need to have like a strategy in terms of how you're going to move forward. So the, if I were to just talk about like me turning blue and all that. So what I did was I came back, I went to see a specialist to ask what's wrong. And, and, and uh, the doctor was able to tell me very clearly based on my experiences over the last 10 years of me climbing, it's going to be more and more frequent. So it's like if a normal person is going to get high altitude uh, sickness at a, at a 5,000, I'm going to get it at two because he explained all these things to me, you see. And you kind of like move forward and you make that decision. Do you going to do this again? If you're going to do this again, how are you going to do this? differently and what kind of protections are you going to take with you you know um, so when I went to 
the, when I did the Inca Trail and the Rainbow Mountain, I went again alone, but I told my guide my problem at the very beginning, right? So he knew what to look out for, because you can't see yourself, you don't carry a mirror when you're like trekking. Um, so it's really hard, and then you're like struggling with, you know, your luggage, your, not luggage, you don't have a wheel luggage, you carry a backpack, right? Yeah, so I was just telling him, and he knew exactly, and he said, okay, but it was not a good thing because he panicked. I went up to the Rainbow Mountain, he took a few photographs, and then he brought me down immediately, because that's the only cure for high altitude sickness. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is really process the experiences, the negative experiences that you have gone through, the trauma that you have experienced, and see whether are you able to move forward. See what can you think about. You know, sometimes it can be little things that you can carry with you. It can even be things like, um, I think Mamie said, you know, how do you put on that that nasty, arrogant look face, which you, I'm sure you practiced over time because you're so sweet, you know? Uh, so it's, it's, it's something like that, you know? You really need to like kind of practice and, and, and see how you're going to do that. So your demeanor plays a big part as well. And I think at the end, you have to go with faith. It's really that, right? Because um, I was just telling, sh sharing with Anita, you know, I don't have this fear and all, but whenever I come back to JB, because uh, I come, come to JB every week, my mom's house is there, I got robbed twice in JB, you know, and, and not in any of this, in, not in Tanzania, not in Peru, you know, but, but in JB, my own hometown, you see, where I grew up, it's around my neighborhood. So sometimes you just need to be vigilant and you need to be able to kind of move forward and think about whether you want to do this again. If you're going to do it again, do it confidently. So I wanted to talk about that barrier. When something happens to you, it's going to happen for sure. But what is it that you do after that? so that you can overcome that second. Because barriers are not just one barrier. It can happen over and it can be a repeat. It can be over and over again, but it's like important to build resilience at the more that you do it. So that's, yeah, I thought I wanted to conclude that way. So now I'll open it to the floor, because um, I'm sure some of you may have questions. If not, I have, I have more questions. Would anybody like to, to ask any questions? No, are you tired? <laughs> not burning with curiosity? Avi, your barrier to asking questions? <laughs> ah, great. There's one person there. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, nice to meet you all. My name is Nadia. So basically, we're talking about breaking boundaries, stereotype, and record through travel. So for me, I'm, I'm still young, I guess. <laughs> still young. Okay, so what I'm asking is how, for, for like uh, Zaiza is that how does you tran transform uh, something that you were inspired to do into, and then motivate yourself and then at the end become a passion and a, a career if, if can, it's possible. So can, can you give me like any advice or, or a, any kind of tips that you can share on, you know, a lot of us younger people, we, we tend to like, oh, we want to be like p bloggers, having people pay us to travel and make it a career. So if there's an opportunity for us to do that or is there a challenge to it and how can actually we, we go through that? I think uh, I always tell this to younger kids and it pains me to call you younger kids, <laughs> to be honest, because I'm still young. <laughs> so I always tell them, be so good that they cannot ignore you. Also, it's okay to go bananas once, twice, three times and forgive yourself. Failure is part of it, you know, go crazy, you're young. I mean, sad to say I'm 30 now, and people are not more for... <laughs> I want to be forever 21. That's the problem. So my brain is like 22, 23 sometimes. So for me, it's about learning to be crazy, enjoy that, go bananas, and forgive yourself after that, because life is long. When you're 30, people won't be too forgiving with your mistakes. When I turned 30, I mean, half of the people who always forgive me when I make mistakes, they were like, nah, -uh, you're old. Get your shits together, girl. So have fun and be so good that they cannot ignore you. Yeah. There's one lady behind. Can somebody give her a mic? Hi, uh, my name is Karen. Uh, Ziza, I hear you about being young, but still 
feeling like you're much younger than you are. So I'm sort of in the same position. <laughs> um, but slightly different as well, because I made very different personal choices when I was much younger than I am now, also in my early 30s. Um, but my question is actually for Dr. Rizwana, because uh, I understand that you're a single parent, um, you have kids, and, and I'm in a similar situation. Recently divorced, it's only been a year. Um, I think when it comes to boundaries and stereotypes and the expectations of women or mothers, and you should be at home with your children, and your role is to be um, responsible, how do you fit that in with travel? I mean, I take my kids on travels with me, but there are times when you just need to go at it yourself, but also growing as a professional and kind of focusing on your career, and um, part of that is being on the move as well. How do you juggle that um, sort of self-worth and guilt and um, also wanting to be the best for your kids um, while taking care of yourself first? Um. Okay, that's a great question, actually. Um, okay, I was just thinking about my f first trip right after the divorce. Uh, that was like s almost 15 years ago. My son was like two and a half, and when I decided to take that first trip alone, uh, he kind of uh, put a... I, I think he, s he kind of swallowed a marble. He swallowed it, and then it just went through. Right? We didn't know what to do and my mom panicked. So it's like, you know, it was really difficult. And I, when I was away, I was in KL. Um, I think one of the things that you can do is to see at what stage, if their kids are really young, it's a bit hard for you to be able to travel. But it's good to have that kind of uh, support, right? It's not just your parents, but it will be great because, you know, I work, I, I used to work with a family, uh, I mean, I, I worked in a ministry that focuses on family. And one of the things that we say is that uh, even if parents are separated, the children are still your mutual responsibility. So what I do now, I mean, since that incident, that was like almost the first few months of my divorce, um, we make it a point, now my kids are 20 and 17. So yeah, they're not as young as your kids. Uh, but it's just that I make it a point to make sure that one of the parents is in Singapore, just to make sure that nothing goes wrong. Um, I mean, my next of kin is still my ex-husband because of the activities that I do, you know. Uh, sometimes I just have to make sure that if anything happens, there has to be one other parent who's alive for the kids. Uh, of course, you know, you come up with all the other precautionary things like insurance and all those things, right? And then you actually share with your kids why you want to do these things and you bring them along with you. Um, there's a lot of um, great opportunities to bring kids to a place where there's no Wi-Fi. That's really, really important especially if they're teenagers, right? And, and bring them to immerse in this nature and all those things. So now we take turns. Um, and balancing that responsibility, don't feel guilty about it. Sometimes you just need to take that break. It's really, really important, um, in, especially in social service sector where people get burned out very quickly. Um, we were just talking about how, you know, you need to support your client, but you also need to support yourself because there's always this transference and counter-transference when you're working with clients who have been abused and all that, right? And at the same time, you need that break. Do what you think that will be great for you. Even if it means just going for a short walk without your kids, you know, or, or, or doing that long run like a marathon and all that. Um, it's just that balance. But I think the key thing, young children, you definitely need the support. Yeah. Great. Anybody else? No? TikTok, TikTok. Yes, Marina, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to ask Zaisa, actually, <laughs> another question. You know, there are sometimes um, we have a lot of prejudices. Uh, people have a lot of prejudices. And I think this panel has done a, a great deal to, to dispel that, you know. I mean, I'm sorry to say, in Malaysia, people think of Bangladeshis as laborers, mostly. And here you are, you're a doctor, you've done all these amazing things. Um, and, and Filipinas, also, you know, we think of as domestic workers. And you went from being a... I mean, this, I, I think I still would like to know how you overcame that from being... Because there must have been a prejudice against, oh, you're only a domestic worker. Who do you think you are? You're going to become a... What? You think you're a photographer and all that. So how did you make that you know, uh, transition 
if you like, from from being a domestic worker to become. I I, mean, I know you be as good as anything, but still, there. How did within Hong Kong or in the beginning? How do you get people to take you seriously? Is is what I'm asking. Thank you for the question. I think. Um, at first, I was younger way back. I always want people to take me seriously because I'm, I'm, I have that, I, I went through a lot of prejudice against my background and to, be a, to break that ceiling and people look at my work in a serious way. I went through a lot of that. Like, for example, I was telling this story a while ago with my friend. When I went back to the Philippines, someone told me, oh, you look important now. Just because I wore a coat. I'm like, what the fuck, man? You know what I mean? So there's a lot of microaggressions that happened to me with my work. But then I was raised well by two amazing people. And also I owe it from my employer, former employer. Because even... When I, was just, when I was working with her as a domestic worker, she trained me in a way that she treated me like a human being. She's amazing. She always tells me, but because when I arrived in Hong Kong, it was during my formative years. So she's a big influence on me. She always tells me this. It's a Buddhist saying, I think. Don't look up to people. Don't look down either. We're all born equal. Or, well, <laughs> Sometimes I want to answer, can you give me some millions so that we're equal? <laughs> but then she explains it to me. It's not monetary. It's not something because at the end of the day, if we die, we all, from dust, we came, we came from dust, we're going to go back to dust. So that's what she, she meant about it. You know, it's not about the money. It's, about, it's not about the status in life. So with, the, with their support, with my family's support, with my employer's support, and the goodwill of other people, I overcame this prejudice. I chose to see the love instead of the hate. Like if people tell me, oh, you're not so good, and, and I have this character, like taking people... People are taking me seriously. Way back when I was younger, I want that to happen. But now, um, I'm like, I can't even take myself seriously. So why would I ask people to do that? So I become more chill. And I learn to forgive myself with all the mistakes that I've done. I think that's the main goal is, the main goal for me is self-love. Like I, I, I said a while ago, you need to be your own hero. And I chose to be my own hero. I, I don't expect other people to come forward and say, oh, that's wrong, don't say that, because that's mean. Most times, if someone is being mean to me, I, well, it depends. Like, if I experience some moments where some men are just asshole, I punch them in the face. <laughs> because we need to, we need to do that. Like, someone hugged me, and my reflex was punch. Because for me, don't touch me. So that's the things that we are supposed to do as women. Don't be afraid to punch someone who's not good to you, you know. Okay. <laughs> I just, is that a, no, I'm just like I mean, to yeah. a crime, <laughs> punching I think, someone. I mean, I, I hope what you take away is that we all have different ways of overcoming our barriers, yeah. right? And it's fine. That's how it's your choice of how you overcome it. So, uh, for me, that's the big takeaway from this because we all deal with different things that we go through differently, and it's fine. And we're still surviving. We're still here, we're still talking, <laughs> and we're still sharing the love. And with that, I say thank you very much. To the, and uh, thank yeah, thanks a lot for that. <laughs> thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.